Okay, well then we're very happy to have Georg Oberdyk here from uh, Bonn to tell us about Donaldson Thomas theory of uh, K3 times an elliptic curve in higher divisibility. Okay, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak here in the seminar and um, yeah. And so, yeah, so this is a topic I, I studied a lot in um, like many years ago and, and somehow and now I come back to it and I mean, over this, like this break, I came back to it and tried to see what else, I mean, what are the kind of the missing pieces that I tried to, I missed um, back in the day. Okay, so, um, so this, this, this problem has a long history. So I, so I want to first give some overview um, on the K3 suffix case about counting sheaves on K3 surfaces, then go to this K3 cross elliptic curve, then talk a little bit about the proof, and then, and here, so, so this counting on K3 times elliptic curve would be in rank one, so it would be DT or PT, Pandit Pandit Thomas invariance. And then in the end, I will just give a very short out, outlook on the higher rank case. So all of this is kind of partially still a work in progress. So uh, yeah, be gentle somehow, but yeah, feel free to, uh, ask a lot of questions and criticize. Okay, so um, yeah, so the talks are maybe not, I mean, they are not written only for this audience, so I apologize for this definition. Um, so yeah, so K3 surface is the K3 surface. Um, and then if you're interested in, in counting sheaves on this K3 surface, really the most basic case to consider is a Skirchuk's formula. So you look at the Hilbert scheme of points on the K3 surface that we all like, and we just ask for its topological order characteristic. And so this, this number we call D of N, okay? So this will, will feature, uh, at least importantly in the first half. And so here S of N is, yeah, as I said, the, the Hilbert scheme. And so then this classical result is by Goethe also. I mean, I think he was in Bonn at the time. So that, um, that if you take the generating series of this D of N, you get this, this kind of product expansion on the right-hand side. And um, so for those people who know this a um, little bit about modular forms, you see that this on the right-hand side is a modular form, okay? but it's not completely true because you have to shift by Q. Okay? So, so if you, if you um, divide this right-hand side by one over Q, it's meaning that on the left-hand side, you shift your integer from Q to the N to Q to the N minus one then you get exactly one of the Fourier expansion of this one over the discriminant of function of tau. Okay, so here this is this, um, this discriminant of tau is this, yeah, weight 12 modular cusp form that, um, yeah, it's essentially, I mean, it's, it's kind of a perfect object. So you get a kind of out of this K3 surface, you get this, you know, out of this one perfect object, you get this other perfect object just by counting other questions. Anyway, so why I'm, I'm doing this, so why is this, Kind of what's the natural thing? So why is that shift natural? So this is the point I want to make here. Um, Q to the n seems kind of perfect. So why do you have to shift? And really, the the, the hint is given by looking at the Mukai lattice. So um, so if you look at this Mukai lattice here in the usual way, so this is the intersection pairing where you we take the product of the usual devices and then H zero and H four. Um, they, they pair negatively with this one, right? And so this is just uh, made up to, to satisfy this last equation here that if you have, um, if you have a sheave and you look at this Mukai vector, then intersection of product exactly gives, matches this order pairing up to a sign. And so then the observation is that if you look at this, um, if you look at this, uh, Hilbert scheme of points, you can realize this as a modest space of stable sheaves in this Mukai vector 1, 0, 1 minus n. Okay. And now it's an exercise. Um, we can try this here, but I, I just have the slide. So if you take the square of v and then take the half of it, then you get minus 2 times 1 minus n half. So that gives you 2 n minus 2 half. So this gives you exactly n minus 1. Okay. So, the, so the right way to think about this counting problem is to, to look at the smallest space of stable sheaves in this Mukai vector and then take its square half. Okay? So then you get exactly this, this modular form on the right hand side. So that's a minor point, but later we would I mean, guess the answer for K3 times elliptic curve and then somehow it's, it's important to have the right, the right notation or the right, the right convention. And so, 
this also gives you kind of a hint what happens in the general case. So if you have a monospace of H tables sheaves on, of primitive Mukai vector V and you assume your H is generic, then again, the order characteristic of model space is just this, uh, the same as this, uh, this D of the Hilbert scheme, same of the Hilbert scheme and given by this model of form. And so um, I was not completely sure of this reference that this reference is okay. And it's in, in Hubert's books, I think gives this reference. So I hope this association to Yoshioka is, is correct. I mean, there's many people working on it. Um, yeah, so I, if, I, if I, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of people. So I hope I get it approximately correct as an attribution. Okay, so, so the, the proof is just that this MH of V is deformation equivalent to this, this Hilbert scheme. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so to just give a basic example uh, coming from curve counting, which we're ultimately interested in is if you look at this MH, so you take beta to be an irreducible curve class and you look at MH, so stable sheaves of rank zero plus beta and order characteristic one. And then this order characteristic is just given, uh, I mean, you've just seen this, and, but it then counts the number of rational curves in this linear system that we see. So this is the Alsace formula, it's classical Alsace formula. And that comes up, I mean, this model space comes up a lot in this BPS counting, this group of Mavafa story that also Jun Young Chen talked about. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the nice case, the primitive Mukai vector uh, on the K3 surface. And then you can go to imprimitive Mukai vectors. And there the story already becomes much, uh, much more interesting and also just more difficult to define uh, in a reasonable sense. And so here, the natural way is to really think about this as a color bl three problem. So you look at the x is the surface times the curve. So that times the c times a1. Okay, so you look at this threefold. And then you look at uh, sheaves which are supported. So I highlight this. Can you see the highlight? OK, so, so these are sheaves supported on this fibers of this, of this projection to the c factor. So they're all fiber sheaves. And you fix the. I mean, the total Mukai vector of the fiber. So meaning you can push this sheaf forward from S cross C to the, to the surface and then take the Mukai vector there and that we ask to be V. And so for this car, we look at this model stack of H Kizika semi-stable sheaf. And now, because you look at semi-stable sheaves, your imperative Mukai vector, you can have complicated, complicated stabilizer. So it's, it's not like a nice, I mean, I mean, it's kind of a nice stack, but it's a stack, okay, so in, in the, Stabilizer groups become kind of kind of um, complicated, and so if you just take the order characteristic, you will not. Uh, I mean, you have to divide by zero too many times, and it's not. Uh, so so or just taking the order characteristic uh, is a problem for this model space. So you have to do something smarter, and the, the smarter thing is this: using this um, uh, this theory of joys um, um, of indecomposables. Okay, and so. And so the, I don't know, so I don't want to sketch the whole theory here. So the idea is essentially you look at this motivic Hall algebra. And so this looks at kind of the stack of all coherent sheaves on this in your X. And the elements are somehow um, varieties mapping into them. And so you view this, um, you view this, you take some of the class of this MH of V in this, in this motivic Hall algebra, you take the generator over all the Vs of the same slope, and then you take the log of that of that, um, of that generating series, and you pick out again the coefficient of v. And so, um, in some sense, this corresponds to projecting down in this in this um, motivic Hall algebra onto the subspace where you have just stabilized the C star. And so, once you have that, you can just um, yeah, rigidify that um, piece or multiply it by C star, and then uh, just take the other characters. Okay. And so, in this way, it's a complicated way, but uh, it gives you um, the right definition for defining a sort of order characteristic for this for this um, uh, for the stacks for the stacks of semi stable sheaves. The passage to S cross C is not related to the fact that the Mukai vector is imprimitive, right? It's um, it's a yeah. I mean, somehow I'm doing two steps at the same time. So I think there's a work of Toda also, which just works on the surface, and you can do that too. But somehow for the for us, somehow the natural setting is S cross C because later we will go to S cross elliptical. 
Okay. So it's, it's, it, it, this becomes a color beyond problem and somehow, it, yeah, it's more natural to work on this threefold. Okay. Um, okay, so, so this produces- can I, can, I, can I ask a question, sorry? Uh, when uh, Julian Shen gave a talk here, he had those um, BPS sheaves on, um, uh, in, right? Do you know what? Yeah. Uh, and so is the, this modified oil characteristic related to that thing or? Yes, and I but I think you looked at local P2 and then I think this doesn't make so much of a difference, but. Um, I mean, yeah, so, so whatever he's doing, he's also secretly always working with a, a local surface for the three board. And he, the stuff he considers on P2, for example, he, he works really with local P2, and then somehow he observes that for primitive, for irreducible class, it's just supportive on the surface. And so this Kupakuma Wafa story is really a, a, a theory of the threefold, not of the surface. So, but I, 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 my memory is not so great what, uh, what exactly. Okay. Well, we can discuss maybe some other time. Thank you. I don't know if he's here, but yeah, probably not. Okay, so um, let me also just make this remark. So if, how do you go back to this? So if you go back to V primitive and H generic, so then um, semi-stable sheaves are stable. And then uh, and then this model stack here is just the, the, the model space of sheaves on the surface um, with the C star stabilizer. That is, I mean, this is the natural modeling problem. And then time C. So all the sheaves are just like, so everything happens on one fiber. So this follows by the stability condition. And so then of course, then uh, everything reduces back to the old case. You, you just take the other characteristic of this. And so you can, but you can ask what's happening in this, in this general case, do you get some exciting new result and, or new invariance? Do you get another nice model form? And the answer is kind of, uh, well, you can think about it this way or that way. In some sense it's as simple as it can be, right? So, um, for, I mean, as simple as it can be, because somehow um, you expect this, this, I mean, this is part of this Donaldson Thomas theory, and you expect somehow nice, um, nice integrality constraints or this BPS numbers from, from Donaldson Thomas theory. So you expect some sort of, I mean, this forces you to have some sort of structure, as mentioned here, and somehow this is the simplest one that can satisfy this. And so this is. Sorry, may I ask a question? Uh, is that uh, like by definition, this N V will always be integer, or it can be like rational number? So N of V would be rational. Would be rational. Uh huh. But I'm saying that in Donaldson and Thomas theory, you expect that everything there are some integers that underlie the Donaldson and Thomas theory, and some of this this I mean, this is this PPS or Gupta Kuma Wafer conjecture, and that forces you automatically to have uh, a nice structure for this N of V that after you pass to such a sum here, down here, then you expect some nice numbers, nice integers, and this is really given by this D. Okay, thanks. And so somehow the, the way you should read this is that after subtracting kind of this multiple covers, after doing this kind of funny sum dividing by the divisors of B, the answer just depends um, on the square of this V over K. And so it doesn't depend on the, um, so, you can rewrite this as somehow after subtracting multiple covers, the answer doesn't depend on, on the divisibility anymore, just on the square. I, I, so are you saying that V over K is primitive in the formula because K goes over all divisors of V? Yeah, so I'm saying that not, I'm not, I'm not saying this, but I'm saying this stuff that I highlight here is exactly the invariant if, if you would assume that V over K is primitive. Okay. And it's, it's something weird. But, but this does not determine, the primitive case does not determine in some sense the- infinite. Yeah, it does not, it does not. I mean, it doesn't, I, I, mean, a fortiori, I mean, a priori it doesn't determine, but a fortiori the infinite case is given by this formula. But the formula involves cases where V over K is not a primitive, so- Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you have to prove this. So this okay. is- the, not automatic. So it's like after calculating, you observe this kind of funny thing that uh, yeah. everything somehow comes from this primitive number. 
Okay, so this is, um, I mean, this was first worked out, I mean, conjectured, I mean, Toda made a lot of examples and uh, built the whole theory for this NOV. And then Malik Toda finally produced the, produced the result. <coughs> okay, so, so this is uh, about sheaf counting. So now I wanna move to stable pairs. And in some sense we could work with the Hilbert scheme, but somehow the first case of the stable pairs computation really happens on the K3 surface. And, um, but still I view this somehow distinct from the sheaf counting in some sense the stable pair I view as sheaf counting on the th three foot. Okay, so this is how you should view this. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we will consider first the first the K3 surface. Okay, so let me give you a definition. So a stable pair on, on a smooth projective variety, so we take any variety X, this is a pair uh, F and S. And so F here is, uh, is a pure sheaf supported in dimension one. Um, so, the standard example you should have in mind is, for example, you take a smooth curve or, um, and then you push forward a line bundle from this curve in, into the, to the ambient space. That's one of these examples. And then the second piece of data is you take a section of this, of this, of this one dimension sheaf with zero dimensional co -current. So in other words, you take a curve together with a line bundle in the section and the non-zero section. So this is how you should think about this and then this, this general space of stable pairs is a, is a compactification of this, of this kind of neat loci. And Le Portier proves that this is projective model space and um, the data we fix here, I mean, there's two data you can fix. The first one is the class of the support of your, your sheaf. Okay, so this F here should be curly F. Or, um, uh, so that you, you Fixed to be better, and then the Euler characteristic of this f you fix to be uh, fixed to be this given number n. And then if you consider the K3 surface, there's kind of a famous calculation of Kawai Yoshioka, which is I think yeah, starting point for a lot of discussion about this about this uh, about this counting, which is the following: that if you take a your curve, if you start with a Curve class on the K3 surface, which is irreducible, so cannot be decomposed of a given square. Then you look at this uh, model space of stable pairs in this, in, this, in this curve class. This turns out to be non singular. And then you can take, just take its Euler characteristic, and then you form um, a gigantic generating series where you sum over this n and you sum over this h. And then you, they give you explicit uh, description on the right hand side. And so here again, I you do this uh, funny shift by H and somehow if you do this here, then it, yeah. So you first have to pass to the three four to give a nice, uh, nice um, justification for that in terms of the Mukai vector. And so the right hand side again is some sort of modular object to Jacobi form, but maybe I skip this. Are there any questions so far? Okay, anyway, so, so this is a great formula, a great theorem, so I could have stated. So let me go to K3 cross elliptical now. Okay, so, um, and so this is a, uh, so the threefold is just this product, K3 surface times elliptical. And in some sense, we didn't do so much compared with surface times C, but we, in some sense, we did a lot because we added up, added in this compact direction. So we get exactly one more curve class here on, on this threefold. So you have H2 of Y. Has of course the whole part, the whole curve classes from the from the K3 surface, but you get one more class. Okay, so your your theory becomes um, much richer somehow because you have, for example, your generating series will have one more variable. The price you pay is that you have this elliptic curve here, uh, and if you have a model space, you act by this elliptic curve on this model space just by translation. And so. Um, this creates a bunch of problems. Um, for once, if you just take the Euler characteristic of this. So the first thing you have to convince yourself is that if you translate by the Euler, uh, by this elliptic curve and you take a um, more or less random stable pair, then it will have uh, just finite stabilizers under this, auto, uh, under this translation action. Okay? So, so the generic point in this model space will have um, a finite stabilizer. And uh, I mean, 
it, it can have infinite stabilizer, so it can have stabilizer the whole elliptic curve essentially only if it's pulled back from the K3 surface. So essentially, if you put beta to be non-zero, this will never happen. So this means that if you look at the model space, then somehow every point lives in the orbit, which is an elliptic curve. And so that means if you just take naively the Euler characteristic, you would just get zero because Euler characteristic of elliptic curve is zero. So, um, so, so we have to do something better than uh, just taking the Euler characteristic. And the better thing is just divide out by this elliptic curve and then, um, and then taking the Euler characteristic there. Okay, so this is kind of a naive, naive thing to do, but uh, this, is the, this, this is what works. Okay, so, so you take here this kind of thing here. This, this means here that I divide it out by the elliptic curve, and then I take this Euler characteristic, and then there's this kind of detail that I would like to ignore in this here, is that we have to weight the Euler characteristic by this function, this Baron function. Okay, so, so the Baron function is a... Um, kind of measures the, 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 how bad a singularity is at a point. And, um, and so instead of just taking the straight Euler characteristic, you take this weighted Euler characteristic, meaning that um, if this function has a uh, um, value k at a point, then you weight that point by, by k. So this is what can, you, can you remind what d is? Hmm? What is d? Is it the Euler characteristic? No, d, d. Yeah. No, D is the, the degree. So so here I, I so I have H two O Y. I decompose it into a direct sum of two pieces, and so the beta will be the element in H two of S, and then the D will be the the yes. multiple of the elliptic curve I pick. So and the n n will be our Euler characteristic. So so n will be our Euler characteristic, and then the um, let me see. And then the, the, the second factor will always be the curve class. So our curve class has two entries now because we have two, two factors. Of course, I could take, just take one factor, but then. And so, so uh, yeah, let me say one more comment. So the, the reason we put in this parent function is to make this count deformation invariant. So this model space is usually singular. Quotioning up by elliptic curve doesn't have, I mean, doesn't make it much worse either but it doesn't help, so it's still some singular object. And then putting in this new uh, kind of um, gives you a deformation invariant count by this, by this Donis and Thomas magic. That's what you call Sorry, can you say again what the Baron function is? Yeah, I mean, this is um, how does it work. So you can write this model space as a, um, as a critical function on a smooth ambient space. And then it's like the all like characteristic of this. Um, Milner fiber at a point or something. I mean, there's various ways to, to think. And you can take this perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles and then take the, just the point-wise order characteristic of this. And I think this is essentially up to some sign is this parent function. Thank you. Um, may I ask the uh, quotient here is that like take quotient as a like scheme? No, as a stack, as a stack. As a stack. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, as a scheme, you don't want to take the quotient as a scheme because this elliptic curve is kind of uh, not your, yeah, like not a reductive group. So it's kind of, yeah. I but see. as a stack, it's kind of the, the uh -huh. formal object. So to say. So sometimes we count up to translation by this elliptic curve. I see. So, so somehow this Baron function is still marrying the singularity of the, the PN rather than the like, quotient. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah, so this new differs from the from the singularities of the space upstairs just by the sign by minus one. So that's one of the properties of the Baron function. You have a smooth map and you just differ by the sign uh, one, minus one to the relative dimension of the map. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. thanks. Okay, so uh, let me state the conjecture for what is this uh, what is these numbers of this default um, this Pander Pander Thomas invariance. And uh, for that, I have to introduce this igusa cask form. Um, and I will not give a formula because I used to do that in the past and I'm tired of writing this formula, but it's as nice as this delta of tau. So we had this discriminant function of tau. And the discriminant function of tau is kind of unique in the sense that it's the, the cusp form of the lowest weight. And so similar, this igusa cusp form of weight 10 is the unique Cusp form, model cusp form for, for the Siegel model of uh, group SP4Z. 
So for gen uh, genus two uh, model a cast form of, of, um, of lowest wave. So it vanishes exactly, so it's zero, it vanishes exactly where this, so you can view this um, upper half space modulo SP4Z as the model space of principal polarized abelian surfaces. And then this Igusa cast form precisely vanishes where your abelian surface splits as a product of two elliptic. And yeah, so this kind of a um, fantastically nice object. Okay, so you take this and here omega is our coordinate on this upper half plane. So you have three coordinates, which is good because somehow for the stable pairs, we already had two and we wanted to add one. So you have three. And then the thing we want to consider is we want to look at a Fourier coefficient of one over chi 10. So chi 10 is this user cast form. We take one over this thing and we take its Fourier coefficient. And so here uh, are the three variables we use. And then there's a certain epsilon you have to, I mean, just a small remark that you have to consider as they somehow for this, for this discriminant function, one over delta of tau, um, the only pole that you can have is at infinity. Right? So um, essentially it doesn't matter where you take this Fourier coefficient, it will always be the same number. Here it actually matters where you take this Fourier coefficient and we take it in this certain region. So that's a point that will come up later again. So, so I will. Okay, so the conjecture, and this is uh, kind of again old, this is, um, the last the last decade, um, is that there's an explicit com complete ex explicit uh, conjecture for this for these numbers and um, modulo this equals a cast form. It's as nice as it can be. And so, so. This is maybe incomprehensible. So let me break this up in two pieces. So this conjecture, so I could also state two different conjectures. Um, the first one is the primitive case. So if you're better here that we have here, if you take that to be pr uh, primitive of a given square, right? Then we know that any two primitive vectors in the K3 surface, if you fix the square there, I mean, you can move one to the other by a deformation. Um, and so, that means in particular by deformation variance, this, this, this PT invariance just depends on these three numbers, N, H, and D. And, and these three numbers exactly, I mean, the PT invariance will be then exactly the, the Fourier coefficient of this, of this user cost form we had before up to the sign. So, um, so for the primitive case, uh, you get exactly the Fourier coefficient of this, of this uh, modular form. So sometimes exactly as in the KT surface case, just uh, from genus one, we move to genus two modular forms now. And then the second part is this part B, um, which is uh, again, the multiple cover formula. So in some sense hidden in this complicated expression is the statement that you can kind of go from um, better imprimitive to better primitive. And the way this works is as follows. So, um, so now you sum over the devices of um, the GCD of beta and N and then um, for each of these devices, you look at this class beta over k. Okay? And now you, you do this kind of funny thing that you, that you imagine that this beta over k is primitive. Okay? So, so you, 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 let's just write prim of beta over k to, to you choose any primitive effective curve class on some other k free surface, just the same squares beta over k. Sure. And so, so so for each divisor of this beta comma n, you look at somehow the dt invariance in this class beta over k, but you assume somehow this beta over k is primitive and, and take the value there. And so, um, so this is called this multiple cover formula. Sorry, can I ask what is the reason for the lack of k squared in the denominator of this formula? Yeah, why should you have a k square? I mean, I mean, in the previous formulas you had k square. Yeah, so it's it's different from the previous formula because here, in some sense, the PT invariance, the, the it's still the model space of the stable objects in the in the vector that is primitive. So it's not really, I mean, it's not the um, and somehow the, the the vector on the threefold. I mean, the beta of course is imprimitive, but the 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 vector on the threefold is still a primitive vector. So you don't see kind of the standard uh, multiple cover formula on the, on the um, in DT theory. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so what is known about this conjecture? So let me just come to the thing. So um, I could have copied the conjecture here. But so if D is equal to zero, so this is conjecture was proven by Pandey and Pandey and Thomas in 2006. Okay, so if beta is, if D is equal to zero, uh, then you have no elliptic curve direction. You're just living on the K3 surface. And, um, and they use some, some very cool argument. Uh, and well, so, so some of the, I mean, they have to also solve these two parts, part A and part B, okay? And so first the part A is the, the, the primitive curve class case. And essentially um, the first thing is they, they develop this framework of um, reduced Donaldson and Thomas invariance. And then they prove this deformation invariance of this counts I just defined. And once you have that, then this part A just reduces to this Kawai Yoshioka formula. Okay, so, so this part, part A is essentially this Kawai Yoshioka formula. So this was, and then plus this deformation variance, but they, which is joined with Maulik. And so the really, the, the key thing that Pani Pandas and Thomas do is kind of go from part A to part B, like establish this multiple cover form. And so the argument they use is really cool. And I mean, somehow what I'll talk later on, we'll kind of build on it. So keep, kind of keep this, keep this name in mind. And so then, uh, then if you go back, so let's consider the general case. So the part A is the primitive case, but B is the multiple cover formula. But A, this holds by, um, yeah, this is that old work of um, myself together with uh, Aaron Dixon and Jun Yang Shen from a while ago. And, and yeah, so this uses somehow, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a little bit complicated to, to how this argument goes, but um, yeah. So, never, yeah, so, so some of the idea is to really understand this model form very well. And so then some of, for the rest of this conjecture, you just have to, just have to solve part B. And so, so part B, I should mention, there's recent work by B and B. Um, so Tim, who, who proved this. Um, so on the K3 surface, if you look at chromophilin runs on K3 surface, they proved this multiple cover formula there and divisibility too. And so in particular, if you just work on the chromophilin side, you can, also get this conjecture of divisibility too. Anyway, so um, so anyway, so I just want to explain how to do this part B step here also for this um, for this conjecture here. Okay, so um, how you go from uh, primitive better to imprimitive better. Okay. And so um, yeah, so maybe before going to skipping to the proof, let me ask if there are any questions. What is the reason for the conjecture? There is a, there is a, a some kind of a structure of this invariant that uh, matches the structure of the modular form, some symmetries. You mean for the part A or the part B? Somehow? Just the relationship with this Igusa modular form. Yeah. So, yeah. So this Igusa thing is extremely symmetric. For example, if you look at this Fourier coefficient of one over Igusa. And there's a certain S3 symmetry in this Fourier coefficient. And this matches somehow a derived autocorrelances of this K3 times elliptic. And so uh, in some sense, um, so you have to work from Donis. I mean, if you work in, Do you can either work in Donis and Thomas theory or, or work in Gomfin theory, both sides somehow force you some sort of symmetry on the answer. And if you combine this both symmetries, then uh, some of the Ibuza cast form is the unique solution that satisfies the symmetry. This is how to understand this. Um, so, yeah. And somewhat more interesting is the question, why is one over the discriminant function coming up in the K3 surface case? That's kind of a, a, a even more interesting question. Or, I mean, a related question. You can ask why is exactly this coming from? And yeah. And there, yeah, so the answer is, I guess, best seen in the Gromophin side. So here you have to use both Gromophin and Donaldson's Thomas side, and then the symmetries force you to have this user cut. Anyway, this is kind of old stuff. So, so, um, so the, um, the interesting thing would be this part D here. Um, so to go from the primitive and better to the imprimitive case, explain why do you have exactly this, um, this, uh, this kind of funny structure here with this sum of this case. And so I already mentioned this, this is the, 
the idea is essentially this idea of Pane, Pane, and Thomas. So um, I could just say, um, look at the look at the paper. So um, so their result. Um, yeah, so maybe I go through this in steps, but well, maybe I can say what they do. So, so they, so they look at pun, uh, PT invariance, stable pair invariance on surface times um, C, so surface times A1, and then they localize on this A1 direction. So you, you look at the localization formula, virtual localization formula, and then um, usually, um, I mean, you get kind of complicated contribution, but they observe that if, um, so, so the contribution will be some, if you work with a Hilbert scheme, will be some nested Hilbert scheme. And some of what they observe is that if you have um, two non-trivial nesting, that you get a, section, a, a second co-section in your obstruction theory, and that forces you to, uh, this, this component not to contribute. So we'll try to use a similar strategy. here. Okay, so let me, let me go start from the beginning and go through this kind of uh, slowly. So the idea is as follows. So you work with a classical Donaldson Thomas invariant. So, I mean, for simplicity, let's just work with a Hilbert scheme of curves on this threefold. That's somehow maybe conceptually easier for now. It doesn't matter because somehow you have a wall crossing between this Hilbert scheme and the stable pair invariant. So the invariants are the same. And so then the next step is instead of using this parent function weighted Euler characteristic, you can trade that to just work with the Hilbert scheme and work with the reduced virtual class on this Hilbert scheme. And what it buys you, I mean, this is just some form of this thing, but what it buys you is that you can, uh, you can apply the de degeneration formula to this, to, this, um, to this count. So you can take, instead of surface times elliptic curve, you can, you can take your elliptic curve, you can degenerate it. So break it into a nodal rational curve, nodal P1. And then if you resolve this, no, uh, this, this nodal P1, you get a P1 um, and you have two special points which are the um, pre-images of the node point. Okay, so, so in the end, you can reduce the whole problem to consider Donaldson Thomas theory of this, of the surface times P1, but you take relative Donaldson Thomas theory relative to this five over zero and five over infinity. Okay. So that's a, that's a standard degeneration argument. And so once you're there, then you can, do some, again, some kind of standard arguments, uh, standard arguments um, to reduce to this, uh, what is called this cap or relative cap. So you look at surface times P1 and just relative to one side. So maybe I don't go into this, how this works, but this is uh, kind of standard. Also. You have to check a little bit. And so then we kind of uh, follow this, this pathway of Pan and Pan and Thomas. I mean, the proof is not, that's not the idea is not very deep. So, so again, we apply the localization formula. So, so kind of after you have Pan and Pan and Thomas, then the, the idea is extension is not so deep. So, so, so then you're on, let's say you're on surface times P1 relative to S0, and then you apply the localization formula on this, on this P1. So you, on the P1, you can scale, you apply the localization formula. And so somehow then two things can happen. Either you're, um, I mean, then the curve, Together with the line bundle, either then can go uh, is completely supported over the over infinity. I mean, so what, how does your fixed stable pair look like? You have a component which is completely supported over infinity, then you have horizontal bars, and then you have some stuff over uh, over zero, which um, by the reduced class you can kind of um, um, rule out. Okay, so in some sense, the stable pairs we just uh, have to consider. Come from this extreme component where you have somehow curves over over zero vertical curves over zero then essentially you just have uh, horizontal um, bars or tubes um, over the rest of your three -fold. and so <clears throat> and so then you observe that this this uh, fixed low side here um, you can write as a disjoint union of nested Hilbert scheme okay, so so a nested Hilbert scheme on the surface is, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a pair of ideal sheaves of, uh, of points here. I, yeah, what do I have? I1 to IR, and then you have a given inclusions. So you also have a bunch of devices and given inclusions of II, just by minus di in this II plus one. 
And so the way to think about this, so, so there's like a dictionary to go from the threefold to this nested pivot scheme, vice versa. And this go, goes as follows. So if you look at a GM equivalent sheaf on the surface times A1, then you can view it as, um, I mean, then Cohen sheaf on surface times A1, you just can look at, uh, you can view as an OS of T module on the surface itself. So to give you this, uh, to give you the stable pairs on the surface times A1, I can just have to give you this OS of T or this, I mean, to give you the subscheme of on S cross A1, I just have to give you this OS of T module. And the one you're doing is, is kind of, you, you look at this, um, this thing here. So you, yeah, so this idea sheets that you parameterize, you just put in the, in the various entries here. And then at some point R ah, here, um, your, your stable pair just stabilizes. Okay, so at some point you just in this, so over zero, you have somehow non trivial structure. And at some, after some half infinitesimal thickening, the only thing you see is just horizontal bars. Okay, so then you just see the same idea sheaf of points there, this higher. And so once you have this, um, this, uh, this nested Hilbert scheme, then you can, um, you can try to analyze the contribution in this, in this thing. Um, and there's, there's a work of Gulampur, Sheshmani, and Yao for, for, um, for local surfaces where they, where they analyze kind of this fixed perfect obstruction theory. So to restrict the perfect obstruction theory to this fixed loss, and you have the fixed part, the moving part, you have to identify these. And essentially, if you follow a similar strategy to this, this three authors, then you can analyze this and you can see that this fixed part matches uh, exactly with the perfect obstruction theory of described by Golampur and Thomas. And so then comes this kind of this, really this key step in this whole thing. And this is um, closely related to this panel panel Thomas step. And this kind of explains, this key step explains this kind of multiple cover structure. And what it tells you is that, so if you go back to this filtration here, so you have the coefficient of T to the zero, you have a coefficient of T, T of T square and so on. So I say a certain step in the filtration is trivial if um, the, the sheaf at the lower end of the step and the sheaf on the upper end of the step are the same. Okay, so you could have that I zero of minus T zero prime and I one of minus T one prime are the same sheaf, right? So then it's just, um, it's, yeah, it's just the, the subscheme is just stacked completely on top of each other. So let's call this a trivial step. And then if something happens from one step to the other, and then, and then we call this a non-trivial step. So if you, and so the key step is that uh, for every non-trivial step in this filtration, uh, you, you get a non-trivial cross-section of your, of your obstruction theory. Okay, so there's the standard obstruction theory on the threefold. Um, for every step, you get, this, get a, you get this thing. And so we, we work with this reduced obstruction theory, which means that um, you already took a corner of a certain semi-irregularity map so one of these co-sections is already killed. And so the upshot of this is then that if you have two or more steps, all the contribution vanish. So it means that um, the whole, the only thing the you can only have contribution from fixed loci which parameterize stuff of the following form. So you have the same sheaf R times, and then you have this kind of this horizontal sheaf, I mean, this, this bars that come out at, at, uh, after this R steps. Okay, so this, this ER is here, this is, is this trivial part. Um, and then this E0 really uh, encodes this curve. And so before we had this K, but really this K, I mean, this R here should be exactly this K from before. Okay, so, um, and so if you look at now the Mukai vector of this, if you calculate this, then you see that this, uh, the contribution of this, this kind of low size exactly given the by the, taking the Mukai vector of E0 and then multiplying it by R. And then plus the stuff coming from the, from the R. And so then finally, we're just down to looking at the Hilbert scheme of a nested Hilbert scheme where you have a, just a single nesting. Okay? And then you have to uh, do a little bit more work and relate this to, uh, and essentially Golampur and Thomas do that to relate this kind of integral then to, um, I mean, Golden Push, Shishmani, Yao do that also in, in a certain case. You have to um, 
you know, then you just relate this to an topological integral on this product of the Hilbert scheme in which this nested Hilbert scheme sits. And so then there's a classical Elling, uh, result of Ellingson curvature and Lin that then these integrals are topological, so they just depend on the square of this class and not the discipline. So this was also the, the argument of um, Pond and Pond and Thomas in the end. Somehow what's new here is that we allow this ER here. In their case, this ER was just a, just a structure sheet. We allow this ER here to be an ideal sheet of the point. <coughs> Are there any questions about this? Okay, great. So um, I wanna come, I mean, I still have like five minutes. So um, let me come to the, give a short outlook on the higher rank case. And the higher rank case is, um, I think what really, but it's also extremely interesting here in this case. So higher rank DT invariance. And let me also just to say this kind of work in progress. And um, so in the end, we'll just be uh, conjecture and which is, uh, I think there's no, yeah. I'm optimistic about this conjecture, but. And so the, the, the motivation really for looking at this, or looking at this high rank case where you kind of, um, where you can kind of observe how the structure really comes from string theory. So they, the string theory is really like this, this geometry K3 cross T2 because this is one of the few geometries that can just solve completely. And this has been somewhat spectacular in, in string theory world. Um, and there's like a ton of work on this, on this, on this stuff and uh, a very explicit prediction. So, so the goal here is to, um, to make sense of this prediction mathematically. So let me tell you a little bit about the physics prediction. This is one slide. Um, I don't know if you're interested in this, but it's kind of, it's kind of, I was kind of, I found this kind of uh, nice to, I, mean, I was kind of impressed to see that this, um, this mathematics matches this physics so, so nicely. And so the physics picture is as follows. So you start with this thing, which is called this electric magnetic uh, charge lattices. So, so you have this lattice of electric charges, lattice of magnetic charges. And as a lattice, it's just a, a, this Mukai lattice of this K3 surface. Then you just add in two copies of this hyperbolic lattice. Okay. And then they consider a fixed charge of unit torsion. So forget the unit torsion for a second, it's just a fixed charge. So this is an electric charge, a magnetic charge, this, this vector QT here, uh, one in the first, one in the second. And then unit torsion means kind of this GCB condition. Okay, so this, I just put this condition in to simplify this, this, this discussion. And then um, the key thing that they uh, observe is to, um, or what they're interested in is this count of half and quarter BPS dynes in, this, in the string theory. And so, okay, so this sounds like mumble jumble somehow, but um, we'll kind of come to that in a second. So. So let me just say what they predict for the squatter BPS dynes in this case. And so the prediction is the following, that a certain count of the squatter BPS dynes is exactly this, um, you take one over this equals a cusp form, you extract a certain coefficient here. So this, this coefficient come here, and then you add also a sign, okay? So if you go back to, I mean, if you, if you remember, if you, um, so this result on Pan and Thomas invariance, it should kind of look familiar because there we also, let me go back. Um, um, yeah, if you look at this line, it, it has exactly the same form. On the right-hand side, you have the coefficient of the cusp form and you have a sign. So let me, and but that's kind of something uh, um, more physicists say, and this is kind of the really interesting part, which, I, which makes me kind of excited about this geometry, um, again, in some sense. And what they say is that this, what, you, what we already discussed is that the right-hand side depends on, the, on, the, on where you take this Fourier coefficient. Okay, so to let me, to, let's, uh, to make that point kind of more clear, let me just rewrite this right-hand side. Okay, so how do you take a Fourier coefficient of a function if you have a function f of z, then you, you multiply it with e to the minus two pi i n z and then integrate from zero to one. 
Okay, so this is how you take a Fourier coefficient. So if you do that here, then um, so you take one over chi 10, and then you have to multiply this by e to the minus two pi i, and then you have to insert the, the variables and the, the, the coefficient that you want to take up here in the, the numerator. Okay, so, um, so for example, if, uh, if you ignore the, the, if you just focus on the first guy here, um, putting this here means I take the Fourier coefficient of Q to the N where N is Q square half. Right, so this is exactly. Um, so if you go back to your somehow calculus, somehow then this is how you do it. And so the way to write this in this form is because now you see clearly that this depends on the choice enemy where you take this integral. Okay. And so I write this here in a sense. And so so the right hand side that you have here depends on this on this contour that you integrate over. And so physics predicts the second thing, namely that the left hand side also predicts uh, uh, depends on on something. It's just not just a count. If there's a there's a dependence on the left hand side. Okay, so we yeah, rewrote the left hand side and added this d sigma here. So the left hand side depends also on the sigma. And so then physics conjectures that this um, that this uh, that you have this equality also for all sigma. Okay. And so the way to read this is that, um, the, so how, the, how is the C sigma related to the sigma on the left-hand side? So the C sigma is this contour given where you just integrate from zero to one in the real part. And the only thing that you change is the imaginary part. Okay? So the imaginary part you change according to a certain function of this, of this parameter sigma. And sigma are called this modular fields. Okay, so now, uh, of course, uh, this notation is uh, somewhat suggestive and this is not an coincidence. So sigma is our favorite letter for stability condition, right? So, um, and so, so what happens now, uh, let me try to give you the mathematical picture of this, of this equation. And so the idea is, uh, is, again, not so complicated, but it's nice that it fits so nicely. So we look at the even cohomology of our Y. So Y is our K3 surface times elliptic curve. And we split it into two pieces. The first is just, uh, um, so, so we take omega e, we we'll consider the class of a point on the elliptic curve, and we split this uh, com even cohomology in the part that is somehow vertical, so it's supported on the fiber over the elliptic curve, and then also in the part that is pulled back from the K3. And so as an abstract lattice, it's just the direct sum of those two Mukai lattices of the K3, lambda plus lambda. And so now let's define this reduced invariance, uh, reduced Donaldson and Thompson invariance. You're kind of good at it now. So, so if you're given a, a primitive vector here, so I assume it's primitive in this uh, V cross V, and let's say you pick a generic ample class, we can again look at the smaller space of H stable sheaf of a given Mukai vector. Okay, so the Mukai vector will be specified by this V and W, as I said before. And then we do this definition that we again take the quotient by elliptic curve and then take the weight of our and so then the answer uh, for this is this follows. And um, as I said, it's kind of work in progress. So um, I kind of this talking too early somehow, but I'm kind of optimistic that uh, about this about this conjecture. What do you mean by a modular space with two Mukai vectors? Yeah. So so I look at sheaves f on this three fold s cross e with the where the Mukai vector of the sheaf F here is written as, uh, as V times this omega E plus W. So V and E are two Mukai vectors on the K3 surface to give you a Mukai vector, to give you a Mukai vector on the uh, three fold S cross E, I kind of have to give you two vectors on the K3 surface. And this is, this is all what I'm doing here. Okay, so it's not two Mukai vectors, like one Mukai vector on this three fold. That you can write and kind of decompose and yeah, it's too too. And so then the conjecture is exactly that uh, what I said before is that this the T invariance on the left hand side um, uh, should be exactly this uh, same expression that comes from this from this physics. And 
What's more, so in higher ranks, so in rank one, this, this left-hand side doesn't depend on which age you pick because the stability condition for um, then is just, I mean, these are sheaves are just ideal sheaves. So, so here, it doesn't really matter which, which age you pick. So, but in higher rank, it matters, right? So Giesecke stability, you see some wall crossing. And the, the claim is that this, uh, this, this integration contour you pick on the right-hand side should be exactly determined by age. And so even more, you should uh, really, you should put here stability condition. May I ask what, what do you mean by the GCD of uh, V wedge W? Yeah, so V wedge W is, uh, is an element in H wedge two of lambda and, that's, and that has a GCD. Okay. Okay, so there, I mean, it's, so, 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 so this V comma W, um, that's a primitive factor, but saying that the wedge is primitive says something stronger. So for example, if, if, if V is primitive and W is like two times some, something primitive, right? Then the, the, this pair V comma W is, is, is primitive, but this wedge is not primitive. So, so this is a stronger statement. I see, but uh, we will the, uh, uh, will the result be related to the Mukai pairing? somehow with uh, uh, of uh, V and W? This result, Owen? Oh, we, we, we the, like the value of the V wedge W somehow maybe related to the Mukai pairing or? No, it's not a number. It's, it's kind of some uh, element of the letters. Okay, okay. But I mean, this, uh, this GCD condition is kind of, uh, I mean, it's not important because uh, you can also do the same uh, conjecture also for the higher higher GCD case, I mean, if G, I mean, if GCD is two or three or higher, it doesn't matter, but then you have to enter, have this multiple cover structure there. Okay, okay good. So, yeah, so I'm out of time. Let me just say quickly. So, um, so the, really the point is that the wall crossing on the left matches the wall crossing on the, of this Fourier coefficient on the right. And this really realized by this E cross E had equivalent Hall algebra. So this is some other work with um, Julie Pierratner and Toda. And then this half BPS science, I said that the physicists um, like this half BPS science. Also, they are exactly coming from this um, um, Maulik Thomas Toda account that I said before. Okay. So, this, uh, this Maulik Thomas Toda evaluation N of V is really uh, contributing this half BPS science, and they, they are essential for this uh, uh, contribute to this wall crossing term. Okay. So, two half BPS. Dines form together a quarter BPS dine. So this is kind of it. And then stability conditions is essential. So yeah, so maybe if you if I could talk in a few months later, then but anyway. Okay, so um, so anyway, so you can try to do this calculation for rank one, and then you see that exactly it matches the stable pair compact computation. And um, yeah. Anyway, so that's the end. So uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Are there questions for Georg? Yeah, um, I have a uh, naive question. So uh, the, the, the whole idea of Donaldson Thomas theory is that the expected dimension is zero for, for moduli spaces of uh, vector bounds or sheaves on, on Calabria or three folds. But uh, in this case, are there, when you study, do you see interesting moduli, uh, I mean, nice, regular, smooth, I don't know, or uh, moduli spaces? What, what kind of uh, moduli spaces do you get when you consider? Oh, on K3 times elliptic curve, or what? Yes, yes. I think you get, I mean, um, yeah, not, I mean, yeah, not, not really nice things. I mean, okay. And, and somehow, somehow there's this, uh, uh, of course you can take stuff on a K3 surface and then pull it back to the, to the, to the threefold, but this is um, really not what you want. So in the general model space would be kind of some crazy singular object. So I don't think there's a hope to get any, any nice, uh, yeah, nice model spaces out of this, out of this problem. Yeah, so this is the wrong place to look for, uh, for look for nice models.
Yeah. 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 Okay, well, these um, predictions that physicists make, they're all very special to K3 times elliptic curve or, or do they make more general ones? Yeah, so they make this, um, yeah, so, so this is really extremely special to the case where you have a holomorphic two form. And so this is, I mean, um, so in physics, there's like n equals to two, n equals to four, and n equals to eight supersymmetry. And, and somehow this n, uh, the number of n uh, relates to the, is, um, to the number of holomorphic two forms you have. And, um, and so, for, um, so for quintic caliber threefold, you're in n equals to two. So, uh, so there you get kind of a much more complicated structure. Here you're in n equals to four, you have one uh, uh, holomorphic two form and that holomorphic two form um, allow, I mean, um, essentially is responsible for this kind of extremely nice uh, close prediction. And so whenever you have some of a holomorphic two form, you expect something similar. For example, you can take a look at the CHL calibre three folds where you take this K3 cross elliptic curve and you quotient out by some, some action, which is a syntactic automorphism on a K3 surface and a translation by this elliptic curve. Then you also expect a similar structure like this. And um, then you can also look at n equals to eight. This is the case of B and three folds. And then you expect it, I mean, but there are some of the structures even, I would say, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not so interesting. I mean, it's, yeah, you have too much symmetry somehow to, it's still kind of interesting, but I think it becomes, formulas become less nice. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a good question how this carries over, whether there's a shadow of kind of this thing that you see in, in this, in, for normal color by three folds. And I think this is not what physicists expect when. Yeah, cool, thank you. I mean, yeah, so maybe there should be something. I mean, May I ask you uh, maybe naive question? Who are you? Uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, like for, for K3 surface, like the, uh, there's this uh, very rich um, theory for the wall crossing for the like modular of uh, stable objects in the mm. uh, K3 category. So I wonder, is there a nice structure for this K3 times E that we have uh, like a uh, wall crossing from PT to DT and to other like stable conditions? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I kind of go, went over this very quickly, but um, so some of the point of this e, e times E hat, if you're in Hall algebra, means that somehow in, in this DT environs, there's, um, so of course you have a lot of wall crossing happening. If you look at the stability manifold and you choose a path that you, you have a ton of wall crossing for a given vector. But then some of the point here is because of, because you define your invariance by dividing out by an elliptic curve, I mean, the, the result is that somehow most of these wall crossings will not contribute. So in particular, if you, if you um, yeah, so, so the, the point about the half BPS dines or this, uh, this, this um, Maulik Thomas total counts is that um, they have a one dimensional stabilizer group. So you just quotient out by a one dimensional um, action here. And uh, yeah, so, so only these kind of will contribute to your wall crossing behavior of the DT invariance. So not as sensitive to the like stable condition as uh, K3 or other contents on K3. So the modulus space changes dramatically, but the invariants stay the same. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So this is kind of the... I see. Okay. So, Great. but somehow, it, I don't know, the upshot is a little bit that maybe you don't care about the modulus spaces because they are so singular. So better not worry about them. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Great. Thanks. Are there other questions for Georg? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one more question. So um, at least uh, can you, um, does this theory give you non-emptiness of modulized spaces? I guess it should. So. Yeah, if your DT invariance is non-zero, then, yeah. then it will be 
Yes. And a better question is, uh, for example, it could be that in some region, uh, for some age, the right hand side vanishes. Can you conclude that uh, also, so the right hand side or your DT invariant vanishes? Can you then conclude that your model space is empty? And that is a much, uh, I mean, that's a harder question, I think. So, so you have such non emptiness result for over a billion three folds? Is there? Yeah, that's true. So for being three folds, um, you have a, I mean, yeah, for being three folds, this, this higher rank case is not, I mean, there's not a, a similar formula as this, as this, because somehow the being three fold case is kind of really a, yeah, a pain because you have kind of several multiple cover structures kind of interacting with each other. And so it's very hard to guess the exact answer in the higher rank case. But in principle, you could have non-vanishing results there. So I, I would like to just make a comment that actually it's very important to understand such question, uh, model space receive and non-emptiness for a billion three folds. I can uh, explain uh, uh, the reason later uh, mm -hmm. in person. Ah, okay. So yeah, so I, I mean, my expectation is that these numbers will be non-zero the moment you have a non-empty model space. So this should give you somehow a criterion to prove non emptiness Are there cases where you can go the other way, where you can say, oh, the, the DT invariants vanish, so the moduli space must be empty? Yeah, so I'm saying that that is, that is I mean... Well, you said it's harder, but are there cases where you can do it? Um, I mean, somehow the point I'm trying to make here is that the, I have no idea about this model spaces at all. And some of the T in, the T invariant just give you a number. And, right. and of course you can, I mean, it's like you take a model space, you have an integral over this, a particular integral over this model space. Now this, num, this integral is zero. Does it tell you something? It's kind of, um, unless you know that your model space is zero dimension, it's usually uh, you have no information. And so, yeah. That's somehow the, the beauty and also the, like, at the same time, the ugliness of this, uh, of this theory that somehow you, you have no idea what you're, what you're actually counting somehow, but you still get a number. Are there other questions for Georg? Yeah, show you the if so, if not, maybe people can also gather in the chat or the sorry, the gather town, which Arend just posted in the group chat if they want to 